let's talk about policy. Specifically, let's talk about trade-offs and unintended consequences and all the evidence that is needed to support your decision-making process. The trade-offs and the unintended consequences may not always be what you think they are. I know that we went over this in the last module, but one of the things that became clear to me is that I'd thrown a lot of information at you. And sometimes when you throw a lot of information at people, uh, they're kind of blinded by all of it. And I was afraid that maybe you were so blinded by the quantity of new concepts that, that you didn't quite understand these two concepts of of trade-offs and unintended consequences. And I say that because after reading the discussion board, uh, it, it was obvious that some people clearly got it, but, but there were a significant number that didn't. So it's important to, um, to go over it. So turn off that flashlight, um, sit back and relax, and, and let's try to work through this one more time. One of the important things in any policy analysis is the quality of the evidence that you are collecting. You need to begin asking yourself, what is evidence as it relates to policy? Is it consistent with the schema of Davies in 2005, which you all read about? And, and and some of the things that were identified in this schema are, are cost and benefits, political expediency, effectiveness, resources, values, and policy context, choices and goals, and side effects. And for each and every one of those, you need evidence. You're not just going to say, well, I'm going to do a cost-benefit analysis, but I don't care if this policy is politically expedient or I don't care if it's going to be effective, or I'm not concerned about the resources it will take to do it. All I care about is the cost. You can't do that. You, you have to actually take the time to find evidence about all of the pieces. Otherwise, you end up with this three-legged stool with one of the legs broken, and we all know that won't work. So you have to search for the evidence you need. The evidence is important because arguments are only as weak as the weakest premise. Now, if you remember from your evidence-based policy readings, one of, the, one of the, the primary things that you were supposed to take away from that was that for every argument, you must have, it has a premise. And, and the premise must be true. And for each premise, there's usually sub-premises. And for the sub-premises, there are sub-sub-premises. And those must all be true. If they are not, and if any of them are false, then your whole argument falls apart, and your case you're making for your policy also falls apart. And the author gives this great uh, example of um, from a murder mystery, which you can go back and read. But it talks about why when the premise fell apart of the prime suspect um, uh, committing the murder, when the first premise fell apart, then everything else fell apart. And they had to start over. And the same thing is true with policy. So look for the evidence of successful policy in clearinghouses and if you do a quick Google search, you're going to find clearinghouses for all kinds of policies on all kinds of topics. So education and medicine and healthcare and policy in general. If you go to those clearinghouses, you will be able to see if anybody has actually proposed this policy before and, and did it work? Did it work somewhere else? Just because it works somewhere else doesn't mean it'll work everywhere but at least it will give you some evidence that under some circumstances, it did work. And then you want to, where possible, find randomized uh, controlled trials because they provide you with truth that a policy did work somewhere. 
Now, I know in policy, that's not an always easy thing to do. But you should at least make the effort to see if it exists and try to find your way to it. So the first thing you need to know before you consider your trade-offs is you've got to look for good evidence. So put simply, a trade-off is a choice. You have to accept having less of one thing to get more of another, or you have to choose between two options, both of which you would be happy with. That's a trade-off. A trade-off a trade-off is not basically uh, having one good option and one horrendous option and saying, oh, well, it's a trade-off. I'm going to take the horrendous option. That's not a trade-off. A trade-off still gets you to your goal. It's just how you get to that goal. So if if you're looking at something and it isn't even going to get you to your goal, well, then that's not a trade-off. That's just a bad decision. Healthcare trade-offs might be spending more on vaccines to prevent spending for the care of the treatment of measles or mumps or chickenpox or any number of diseases that are vaccine preventable, HPV. You spend now on vaccine development and prevention so that you don't spend later for not only the cost of treatment, but the lost time that a person can't work because they're ill. Evaluating the trade-offs requires comparing the cost and benefits of each of the alternatives. So not just the one you want, but all the alternatives that you're evaluating. And most trade-offs are not all or nothing. Rather, they typically involve small changes at the margins. And I provided you a link to a matrix. And, and the matrix basically shows you the, um, the direct and the indirect cost, the consequences, as, as well as it will show you the unanticipated and undesirable outcomes that you could end up with. So I highly encourage you, when you read the article, to pay close attention uh, to the matrix. And when you're doing your evaluation of your alternatives, try to put them in that matrix and see what you think when you're done. And it may make you quickly realize that an alternative that you're proposing isn't really a good one. One common discussion of trade-offs in healthcare is mandatory vaccines, vaccination for influenza in hospitals. And a lot of people have very strong opinions about this. But it's the example, I think, that we're going to run with in our discussion because there's an article that actually discusses influenza trade-offs. And since people were having such a hard time understanding the concept of trade-offs, I thought it might be helpful to read an article about something that we've talked about before, which is mandatory vaccinations, and something that anybody that's worked in a hospital in the United States has certainly experienced, and not to mention anybody that's in a nursing school, whether undergraduate or graduate, has experienced the requirement to have an annual flu vaccine. So I included the article, What's Public, What's Private, Policy Trade-Offs and Debate Over Mandatory Annual Influenza Vaccines for Healthcare Workers. And in public health, we've long approached the population rather than the individual. We recognize that individuals don't always make the decisions that are the best decision for everyone that is around them. And, and we see this frequently with parents who choose not to vaccinate children. They don't want to vaccinate their children because they have bought in to what all evidence suggests is a false belief about a link between vaccinations and things like autism. 
Now, all the scientific evidence pretty much says that's a false belief. But the parents, rather than taking any risks whatsoever, will not vaccinate their children. And then if their children get sick and makes another child sick, well, we all know the story. That is a person that thinks they're making a good decision, but not only for their kids and the population, it's a bad decision. Uh, So in public health, we're used to the concept of mandatory vaccinations, and we're used to making decisions that serve the population rather than the individual. And max, mandatory vaccinations have long been supported by U.S. policy and, and pretty much long supported by the healthcare community, if not individuals. So what are the policy trade-offs? Deborah Stone identified four values that dominate policy discourse. Equity, efficiency, liberty, and security. Equity is distributions that are fair even though though they have equalities and inequalities. And she, of course, gives the cake example, which most people love. Um, But equity does not always mean equal. They really aren't the same thing. And at this point, most people have seen uh, the graphic of uh, the people standing on the steps and one says, you know, that they're equal and they're all on the same level. But when it's equity, uh, the, sh- the smaller, younger, shorter child has a higher step. And that's equity. It's not always equality. So remember the who, the what, and the process when you're thinking about equity. Efficiency is getting the most for the least. We can all understand that. Um, We know it because anybody that's ever bought, bought a car knows that you try to get the most for the least amount of money. We frequently deceive ourselves in thinking that we succeeded in doing that. But but nonetheless, we try. It doesn't tell you the goals, the measures, who is benefited, and how to count the inputs, the opportunity cost, and so forth. So efficiency is about getting the most for the least, but there's a lot of things that efficiency in itself doesn't tell you. Liberty is freedom, and we all want freedom. And and so Deborah Stone quotes uh, uh, J.S. Mill and and says, um, Liberty is freedom from coercion by others. People should be free to do what they want unless their activity harms other people. Now, you can see why this would be an issue in the vaccination argument. And then security is simply freedom from fear is one way to think of it. So how do ordinary people feel in response to events and policies over which they have no control? These are all things uh, to consider and trade-offs. So policy trade-offs in mandatory vaccinations, remember, The goal is to reduce the risk to the public. But this requires infringing on the rights of individuals, so on their individual freedoms. We take away part of their liberty when we have a mandatory vaccination policy. And you will frequently hear the argument, does duty to care outweigh undergoing a forced medical intervention that's repeated annually and is preventive rather than curative. Ma concludes that good intent or even good evidence cannot be taken for granted as the sole prerequisite for public health policy decisions.
we're going to discuss this in the discussion board and, and we'll keep discussing it because I think that this is really a key concept that you must understand. The next concept that I want to quickly review, and this will be a quick review, is unintended consequences. Because there's a difference between a known outcome. You have a policy, and when you make the policy, you know that that policy is going to result in X. And an unintended consequence, which is something that you actually didn't anticipate. You didn't know it was, you didn't foresee it happening. And for many of you in the discussion, you talk, you were talking about uh, the Medicaid expansion and, and that the number of people not getting health care as a result of states not taking it uh, was an unintended consequence. That would be true about the drafters of the Affordable Care Act. For them, that was an unintended consequence because they had, they did not predict that the Supreme Court would say that Medicaid expansion uh, didn't apply to everybody and that states got to choose. So for the drafters of the policy at the federal level, yes, that was an unintended consequence. But for the states that made the choice to not take it, they knew what they were doing, and they knew what the consequence was. That was not unintended for them. So unintended implies a lack of purposeful action or causation while the unanticipated means an inability to forecast what eventually occurred. So there are both desirable and undesirable. So positive and negative or mixed um, unintended consequences. So, so let's think about some of the undesirable ones. And we think of those as, as moral hazard increases. So a, a, a good example of a moral hazard increase is that we provide flood insurance for people that live in flood zones uh, through the government because most insurers won't, won't provide that. So we provide it through the government. But what that results in is people being willing to live in a flood zone that they might not otherwise be willing to live in. That's a moral hazard. Um, a drift from reasonable regulations to over-regulations, and, and that happens sometimes. And you see it all over the federal government now that we've gone from regulation of some things to really severely over-regulating some things. And some things we regulate with absolutely no evidence that it actually made it better. And that is a tendency, and it does happen. And then there's rent seekers. And when we say rent seekers, what we're talking about is you have a policy, and somebody sees within that policy an opportunity to make money. And, and if you want to take a, um, a, one example that people talk about, the military-industrial complex in war that people will see them as taking advantage of, of policies that we currently have. But in healthcare, it, you likewise will see the same thing of people taking advantage of policies that we may put in place to make money because they say, wow, there's an opportunity for me. We have anticipated and unanticipated. Can, can X be predicted? Can we predict what happens if people don't get, if we don't have mandatory vaccinations? Well, some things we can predict. We know that the vaccination rate would go down. Um, can we predict what would happen in states that didn't take Medicaid expansion? Yes, there would be more people uninsured. Some things you can predict. There's direct versus indirect. So does the input cause X directly or was it a chain of events? 
So something happened that caused something else to happen that caused something else to happen. And boom, now we have this bad thing that we didn't want. And then there's latent versus obvious. Um, it's obvious. Is it obvious? Or does it take another event to make it known? I have a link um, to a graphic that I want you to look at on this one, and I think you will find it very useful. And I, I have an article that I've included for my class, which is Anticipating and Addressing Unintended Consequences of Health IT and Policy. And this is a really good article about something that every one of you works with on a regular basis, which is health IT, electronic medical records, and all the things that go with that, and some of the unintended consequences. So I think that this is an article that will help you better understand the concept. And then we will have a discussion about that. So after you read the articles, join the discussions. If you're in my class, you can join the discussion of this article and the other article on trade-offs on the discussion board. If you're merely interested in the topic, you can join the discussion on Facebook. I provided the link. Or on Twitter using the hashtag health policy and at Roberta Lavin. I hope this helps you to better understand the concepts of trade-offs and unintended consequences. And if you have any questions, you know how to reach me.